Okay, our final keynote for the day is from Dylan Jay. Uh, Dylan is the CTO of Pretagov, an innovative uh, SaaS software as a service that delivers secure, supported government websites in the UK and Australia. Dylan's also the technical director of Preta Web, a core contributor to Plone and Zope, creator of several open source projects including Funnel Web and Host Out, and he also finds time to run the monthly Sydney Python meetups. So please make him feel welcome. Um, g'day. Um, so I'm going to talk, uh, this is, th for anyone who doesn't know what I look like, that's what I look like giving a presentation. So it <laughs> looks a lot like this. Um, so as uh, I was just introduced, um, my name is Dylan Jay. I'm a Plone core contributor. I'm not actually a foundation member and uh, it was kind of interesting hearing about the, a lot of the issues around, uh, you know, money versus, uh, you know, a blessed plugins and all that. It's really interesting comparing that to the Plone community. Um, but anyway, Plone has a, a foundation and so on. I'm not a foundation member. I just need to apply. Um, I've never written a single line of Django. It's a, can I tell you it's a little bit intimidating standing in front of all you, you know, really keen Django people um, have, uh, saying that. Uh, what I have, I have been is I've been around uh, the, the traps a little bit. My first web application was back in uh, 1995 with ISAPI. Does anyone know what ISAPI is? Yeah, see? Yeah, very, very hesitant. Uh, it's the Microsoft version of CGI. Um, I built my first proper website um, uh, in 1999 on Zope. Um, started a startup in 2003, and since 2004 we've been um, doing running consultancy, and we now focus mainly on government and loads of sites. Um, so the reasons for this talk, the main reason for this talk is that Russell asked me. So, uh, and this is what he said. he said. He said you guys are very welcoming that you have this tradition of uh, uh, looking at other frameworks and trying to see and learn from what else is kind of out there uh, in, in, in the world. Um, so my, my, from my perspective, what I wanted to get across, um, I want to talk a little bit about history. I think um, there's some really interesting kind of uh, developments of how frameworks and things that have developed in, um, in, in the Python world. And in fact, uh, I was at the hack night, the Sydney Django hack night the other night, and I met a guy who was really excited about Django, and he said he was very, very surprised there were other frameworks in Python. So um, I'm sure none of you are like that, but I'm hoping to sort of illuminate um, what else is out there. Um, and if... <laughs> So, so the other thing is about ignorance. Um, I'm sure no one here has ever said anything bad about any other frameworks, um, particularly uh, frameworks like Zope or Plone. Um, but, you know, it's important to know what you're slagging off before you slag it off. Uh, so that's more for the video audience, not, not you guys. Um, mostly what I want to talk about is making better choices. So if you can't read that bit at the end, it says, uh, uh, there is no perfect framework, only the perfect mess after you pick the wrong one. The one's gone missing. Um, so this is my interpretation of a kind of a, a real rough landscape of a family tree of, of how things got invented with regard to the Python web. So you started way back in 99 with uh, the, uh, the CERN HTTPD. You had CGI. Um, I'm kind of just skipping a little bit. There's all this kind of PHP stuff in between, but let's jump to sort of Ruby on Rails. Um, <laughs> Not Python, but uh, very influential. I, I think I've got the history a little bit wrong here. Um, they, you basically had this explosion around the same time of loads and loads of different frameworks, all inspired or coming off the same sources. You know, from hearing the history there, it sounds like Django was around about the same time, not directly influenced by Ruby on Rails, but um, what you had is this big explosion, and there's loads of frameworks in that, in that kind of pre-Cambrian sort of explosion. Um, now, you've got this kind of alternate history. Uh, so when you look at the first uh, release of Zope, or the first instance of when Zope, that goes back to 1996. It's a very, very long time. And it, and it comes from a different idea. Um, it doesn't come from the idea of using routes the same way uh, that uh, Ruby on Rails or Django does. Um, and I'm going to explain a little bit about that. Um, you had a reinvention of Zope, a different way of thinking about it, uh, which was called Zope 3, which is a really bad idea, because you don't 
reinvent something and then call it with the number three after it. So they eventually called that, fixed that and called it Boo Bream, but the damage had been done. But really the, the bits and pieces of that that are, get reused in other things is called ZTK, Zope Toolkit. Um, and my colleague uh, Adam Terry is going to be giving a good talk about the Zope component architecture and Zope Toolkit, which are all interesting reusable library bits and pieces for configuration, um, plugins, and uh, and uh, URL sort of stuff that you can do that isn't itself a framework. Uh, then you've got Plone, which is the bit I've been mostly involved with. Um, so that goes back to 1999. So it is one of the, uh, the first CMSs. Um, and what's really interesting about Plone is that it actually uh, is built on top of the original Zoop, but still has stuff in there, but it also took in a whole lot of uh, stuff off the Zoop 3 stuff. Um, you've got new inventions like Flask, the, the advent of kind of micro frameworks. Um, now you've got BFG, um, BFG and Pyramid, you, they don't call themselves a micro framework, I believe it's a micro framework and I'll talk a bit about that later. Um, that kind of got merged with the pylons thing and became Pyramid. And you've also got quite a new thing which is these uh, static site generations which is another way of thinking about uh, how to do websites um, and Nicola is an example. So, so um, a little bit of this is the history lesson. So this, uh, this guy here, so we've got to cast your mind back to 1996. How many people were coding in 1996? Uh, a third, half, that's pretty cool. <laughs> so things were happening in 1996. You had web servers and, and the way a web server works is that you have a path to a file and it just reads the file and serves it back. That's the way it works. CGI is you have a path to a script, you execute the script and it takes the arguments and then get something out of the database based on the arguments. Uh, the other thing that was happening is OO was really big. You know, this idea that if you, uh, you know, all your code's going to smell good if you object oriented everything um, and, it's, and it solves all the problems of building complex software. Um, so Jim Fulton was on a plane. Uh, it's a really interesting story. He was on actually a plane uh, to do some training on giving CGI, but uh, he'd never done CGI before, so he's reading the manual on how to do CGI and he's going, this is kind of shit, I can do better. So on the plane back, he, he wrote uh, the first version of Zope. Uh, now, the central idea to Zope is this, is this idea of traversal, which is instead of having a path in a file system, you have a path to an object so that you have an object file system. So why have dumb HTML files? Why not have actual Python objects? Um, and then the last bit of the URL is the method of the object. And that's what they called object publishing environment. So ZOOP is uh, also recursive al um, acronyms. We were also big back then. So um, that's the central idea of how traversal and, and uh, ZOOP works. Um, I'm just going to skip through this stuff. The ZODB, the only, that's how the persistent stuff works in ZOOP and Plone. Um, I think it's what's really interesting is it is actually really easy. It's installable by itself. It's incredibly fast. Uh, and lets you put anything in there pretty much. Um, for intensive purposes, you know, if you want a quick persistence layer, I definitely recommend it. Um, uh, but it has a, a crap load of stuff in there. Like it, it runs um, some massively big websites, uh, including most of the ones I'm on call for right now. So uh, if it falls over, which it pretty much never does, um, I might get a call. Um, so the Zoke Toolkit. Um, now, OO turned out to be not quite so flexible and not such a great idea. So they kind of learned from that mistake and said, well, we can, we can have an architecture that's a bit more flexible and it's all about adapters. So the idea of an adapter is you have an object that maybe has an interface. So Zoop includes this idea of interfaces in Python, um, something that you'll get in languages like Go or uh, Java. There is actually an implementation of interfaces for Python. Um, it's used by uh, other frameworks as well, like uh, Twisted. Um, so the idea of an adapter is that you have uh, an object with an interface and you want another interface. An interface is just a promise. So you're saying, I've got something that has this promise and I can turn it into something with that promise. So it's not about subtype anymore. You can just say, look, what I really need, let's say, I really want a Twitter feed, but I have an RSS feed, so I have a way to turn uh, something that implements uh, an RSS feed interface and get this Twitter feed interface. 
Um, turns out to be quite a good way of, of sort of componentizing your application and allowing uh, overriding, which is, is used a lot in Clone. Traversal, so they took this traversal idea where you have, uh, you know, the last part of the, remember the last part of the URL was the, uh, the method name, and it, all it did was look up this object and see what the method names and go, okay, that's the one. Um, so they reimagined this, and, and instead of uh, having um, the traversal then becomes a multi-adapter where you've got multiple interfaces turning into one uh, object at the end. So you have a, a context which is worked out from the path, and then you have a request. You have the name, which is still the last part of the URL. Uh, comes out with a browser view, which is very much like a Django kind of uh, view class. Um, and then you render some HTML. Sounds a little bit complicated. What it means is that there's a really um, easy way to override any view in uh, Python and, uh, sorry, in, in, in Plone or Zope. And Pyramid inherits some of this, so it's possible to do in Pyramid as well. So Plone. Um, so Plone uh, has uh, 300 plus uh, contributors, slightly different uh, model. It's a bigger framework, so we need more people contributing. Um, 400 plus plugins, it actually has thousands, but I'm just including the ones that are kind of compatible with the latest versions. Um, it has 1,000 plus commits per month, uh, five to eight sprints per year. Um, the sprinting has been a, a culture going right back um, in, in uh, one of the uh, things that's really kind of um, been pioneered, I think, in the Plone community. Uh, there's one Plone Foundation similar to Django. Uh, and security is one of the big kind of selling points, I think, of Plone, other than ease of use and all these other kind of CMS things. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I say the FBI use it as their main website. Um, one thing we don't have in the Plone community, by the way, is uh, the equivalent of, say, Acquia with Drupal, which is one big hunking company with a lot of money in order to spend on marketing. Um, so I did have, um, these are, so you can install it using a unified installer, blah, 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 it's pretty, or you can actually do an awful lot with things like uh, uh, SaaS services like Plowed or our one called Predigov, you can create a site really easily. Um, so I'm not sure if I'm going to have enough time or if the video is even going to work, but I can just... Uh, switch out here. I think it's easier if I just show you. If you start at Plone, then you get like this, uh, something like this. So one of the interesting things about Plone, it doesn't start from the root. Uh, it's, you can have multiple sites in one Zope instance. So you can create as many Plone sites as you want in the same install. Um, so it's multi-site out of the box. Um, I've created one already. Default theme, but you can change the theme to whatever you want. Um, editing, click around the place. Um, so one of the things about it is that uh, as, a, as a CMS system, they, uh, they don't, you won't see things like um, fonts and, and colors and stuff. It tries to work in a way that restricts, uh, you can add all those things, you can add all those buttons in there, but you want, you want a consistent style across the site, so it does things with styles and so on, um, and lets you do images and all sorts of stuff. Um, workflow is one of the things that, um, so it has all this kind of built in, um, in terms of publishing and keeping things, uh, you know, hidden until a certain date, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but unlike a lot of other systems, you've got an awful lot of configuration you can do through here. Like for instance, um, the uh, workflow manager, you can create very f uh, flexible custom workflows with multiple review steps, et cetera. Um, we've got an inbuilt theme editor. The theming editor is uh, really interesting. Um, this is one of the big things. Previously, I would have said that Plone wasn't the easiest thing to theme. Um, but the way this theme editor works, or the way the actual theming works under the, the hood, is it's all about pulling the CMS through into uh, existing HTML and CSS, so that you can get CSS developed uh, HTML, uh, JavaScript develops, pull it into a theme, you can rip it off existing website, and then you've got a theme. Uh, it, it's incredibly quick, it allows you to override the HTML of any part of the CMS, so it makes customization very easy. Uh, and by the way, it's, it will work outside of Plone, it'll work as a whiskey uh, middleware. Um, it's, it's a really interesting piece of technology. Um, it's increased 
decrease the amount of time it takes for us to theme sites and given us a lot of flexibility. And they've got this nice little thing here where I can say, well, you know, if this is the theme here and I want this to say the main content, I can pick this and then I can pick this and then I can create a, where is it? Oh, I can't edit it because I'm, it's the built-in one. I need to copy it. Um, but anyway, you can just sort of say where you want bits and pieces out of the CMS and have it dynamically generated. Right. Um, So adding plugins um, uses a system called Buildout, which is a really interesting configuration tool. Um, that's the theme editor video. We'll skip that. Overriding is kind of what I talked about. Don't mind the XML. A uh, little bit scary. I know people don't like it, but it's essentially the same idea I talked about before. We we've got this kind of interface layer, which means that you know it only applies to one particular section or or, or our particular site. And what we're saying is that this particular view is able to be overridden because it has a more specific layer, or because we want it to do uh, apply to only a specific kind of content. You know, instead of being all pieces of content, it's only applying to news items, for instance. So news items have their own interface, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so you can really target and say, I want uh, to override this under these circumstances. Um, so what about Django CMS, which seems, seems to be, how, how many people think Django CMS is the best Django CMS? Is it the winner? There's mezzanine, there's others, there's heaps of them, right? I, don't, I, I wasn't sure, I wasn't sure. But anyway, I, I found this um, comment on a blog the other day. So um, I thought, well, yeah, yeah it's, it's, it, it's got a lot of stuff in it. It's not too bad, but it's not as capable. Um, there's a bunch of things, um, content types, didn't seem to be quite there, the workflow editor, built-in search. Essentially, like, there's a lot of stuff here that you may never ever use, but what we do is we work with government and they have tenders and they have long lists of stuff and these things come up again and again and again. So if you want a really, you know, capable enterprise content management system, uh, Plone, more than any other system I've seen, ticks all those boxes. Um, and this is, this is a, um, a group that sort of, uh, um, consults around CMSs, and one of the interesting things about this graph, if you look down the bottom corner there, Plone's one of the only single technology solutions that actually crosses sort of three of those little, they're all sort of different lines representing functionality. I think the, the ones it crosses are portals and content integration, web content experience, and collaborative tools. Um, anyway, that's, that's one group's take on it. Um, one of the things I really want to talk about is, well, so how does it apply to you guys? How, when you're saying, well, when should I use a framework? When should I use a CMS? Why do I um, bother? Should I use Django CMS, et cetera? When you're considering a CMS, the most important thing to understand is about roles. Now, this is a really, really important concept that I want to get across, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring out my big guns, which is um, Lego figurines. So. You've got the content editor role. Now the content editor role, this is kind of go from least sophisticated up to most technical. Um, they're the ones who, are, who know about content. They want to write stuff and put it on a website. You've got your site admins. They do things like uh, you know, set workflow policies or permissions policies or things like that. Um, you have reviewers, so they, uh, in fact, actually the reviewers should be first, they're the least technical, because all they do is look at that they're maybe a manager and say, yeah, that's actually the right one to go, I'm gonna make that live. Um, you got integrators, they're the sort of ones who install plugins, customize a little bit, know how the customization mechanisms work and get um, a final site to look um, and, and bring it all together. Now you have this kind of front-end developer themer type person who, who knows about the JavaScript and HTML and CSS, et cetera. And you have this back-end developer or plug-in developer. So how does this work with some various scenarios? So let's say you've got a developer's blog, right? Um, so they're kind of like a, a sort of a technical person. They're, they're, they've got a bit of technical knowledge and they're also uh, you know, writing the content themselves. So. I, Static site generation is perhaps a really good solution for them. You know, it, uh, they're familiar with the command line. Um, they can handle writing um, HTML if they want. Um, um, there's 
there's not a lot of other roles needed in that system. Um, an, app, uh, an app or a startup. Um, now there you want, uh, you've got a very technical team again, you've got a front end developer. You don't really have content editors per se, most startups don't, like if you take Facebook for instance, there's lots of user generated content, you've built a site that allows users to, to create content, but you've, you've specially constructed how that, that user generation of content uh, works and you want complete control over that, the number of pages that have words on that are pages with you know, long documents and things like that, there isn't a lot of them really. So it's a very technical team. You want full control over the whole experience. An app or a startup, my definition is something you need lots of wireframes for as opposed to, say, a design mock-up. Um, something like Django Pyramid, a framework. So a simple blog. Um, you've got a content editor. They do not really technical. And then they're going to pull from the cloud. They're going to pull a, a CMS uh, with plugins, maybe, uh, and themes, maybe an off-the-shelf theme, you know, like you can with WordPress. Just pull it off, the, off, off there, maybe change a couple of colors or something. Um, WordPress, for example. So large content site. Now, this is where you really need all those different roles. Now, this is where a CMS comes in, because a CMS is a purpose-built piece of uh, software that allows for different interfaces for these different roles. So you have a content uh, editing interface. You have a different uh, part of the interface which is to do with you know, setting policies and allowing policies to happen. Um, so a bad CMS or a simple CMS um, is not going to have as many of these different sort of purpose-built interfaces. They're going to, you know, you're going to have to go from being content editing to jumping deep into PHP to get anything done. Um, so a good CMS tries to really uh, have purpose-built things, uh, interfaces targeting those different um, roles. So you know, this, this is, say, a large content site for a, a big organization, say. Um, they've got their own technical team. They've got an integrated and front-end developer on board, so they're building their own theme in-house. But then they're still going to take, um, maybe they're going to base it off a theme off, off that they're going to download. Uh, and they're going to, of course, use all those plugins that are out there. Um, now, web consultancy like mine, so we have, you may, you may be a bit more technical, you may have a developer, you develop your own plugins, we do develop our own plugins, we try not to, we want to reuse what's out there. Um, but you'll have the front end developing the theming in-house, you'll have the, the integration in-house, um, you're giving it to customers who have their own site admins um, and content editors, um, so you need to give them something that's really simple for them to use. And again, you're pulling plugins and so on off the web. Um, so that should. So the reason I put CMS and framework there is because it kind of depends what you're doing. Sometimes you're doing things that are a bit appy, and sometimes the better result is to ha actually use a framework instead of a CMS um, as a consultancy. So one of the things you face with CMSs, however, and frameworks is what I like to call the customization cliff. And I've seen this happen over and over again where people have said, oh my god, Plone is, is horrible. I've tried to build a, uh, a new Facebook using uh, Plone and just, you know, it just doesn't work. You know? and, and what this means is with a framework, you have a reasonably linear, it's not always linear, but you have a reasonable linear sort of curve. So you start out, um, things are pretty easy, and you add features and, and they take work, and then you get more and more. But with a CMS, it works a bit like this, right? You're starting off a lot easier. You've got more out of the box when you first start. Uh, so you're getting more and more customization, more features uh, more quickly. But then if you start to fight the framework, if you're trying to do more and more stuff, if you want something very, very customized, something like an app, then you're really fighting the framework too much. And there's this line at which you would have been better off if you just started uh, with a, a framework like Django. Uh, and you should never have used a CMS uh, like Drupal or anything else for that. Uh, biggest problem with this, though, is you don't always know where that line is. You know, it's not obvious to you when you start out. It's it's something that you will know if you know the technology very very well. And this is uh, why, in a lot of cases, uh, doing um, a framework in some ways uh, is the better choice sometimes because you will know you have that more kind of linear predictability. Uh, it's great if you're a, 
that, that really comes into play if you're someone like me who has to quote on things and has to estimate development and, and work out how much something's going to cost. Having a, a predictability helps. Um, so for, to summarize framework versus CMS. Um, so frameworks, you start with a blank page generally. Uh, generally CMSs, you've got something full out of the box. You've got a whole site and then you, you customize it down. Whereas frameworks, you kind of build up. You add in plugins and you, you kind of add the different bits and you, you build up. And you only add in functionality, for instance, when you want it. Whereas there's a lot of functionality out of the box with, it, with most CMSs. Um, so it's good for app sites, good for content where you want to give the content, uh, the responsibility for content to other people. Um, you, you only have those, those small amounts of roles that can work on a, on a Django site. Django does have the admin. You can, you can give that over to, to people if you're happy with people using the admin interface, but it's not something that you can customize so much, I don't think. Uh, you know, it's still a little bit technical. You're not going to give that to all non-technical content editors. Uh, whereas the CMS has, has support for all these different kind of roles. So start tool, agency tool. Um, so with a framework, you know, back to that graph, you, you risk perhaps reinventing things. If you're trying to build a CMS, uh, then maybe you should just use a CMS. Uh, whereas with a CMS, you might risk hitting this sort of customization cliff. So pyramid. Uh, how am I going for time? Pretty good. So pyramid. Pyramid. Um, they called it, uh, it's been called a number of things. They didn't call it a micro framework. They called it a, a non-opinionated framework. Um, the general idea was like a, uh, micro frameworks. You don't come with an ORM. You don't have a, an admin interface. You try and be quite lightweight. And the other thing I was trying to do was trying to have a lot of flexibility with regard to how the URL uh, works. So they have both the routing type system as well as the traversal system we talked about before. Um, is also designed to be very fast. Um, it's my personal opinion, I did, I did tell this to Chris Madonna uh, when he changed the name to Pyramid. I wrote him an email that said basically these points, so this is getting it off my chest. I think it is the worst name ever. Django, by the way, very good name, sounds great. Uh, um, so Pyramid, you know, the structure. And we've got Pyramid the Framework. So Pyramid the Structure is ancient. You know, not a good you know, marketing term to call your framework something that's so sort of crusty and ancient. Uh, whereas Pyramid is really, the framework is designed to be the best readers, trying to take the best ideas out of everything that was available at the time and, and build something better. Um, pyramids just stay exactly the same, completely unchanging over time. One of the things I think about, the best things about Pyramid the Framework is that it's really extensible and flexible. It's going to grow with you. Um, and most importantly, it, a pyramid, the structure, you've got to start with a big base. It's really hard to start. You know, you imagine how many slaves you had to have to start with, I don't know how, how many meters an average pyramid is across, right? And then you end with a small tip. Whereas pyramid really is about, you can start with the very smallest uh, uh, amount of code and then it has all the stuff under the, the hood that will help build bigger apps like, like overriding and, and uh, you know, if you want to use traversal in there, if you want something that's more CMS-y, then it has that kind of capability under the hood. Um, so it's got a lot of the stuff, you know, it's not just a micro framework with uh, where you're going to hit this wall um, of, well, I wish it kind of worked in a slightly more flexible way. Um, so it's a bit more like that. Um, so pyramid, it is a micro framework. No, so there are different definitions of what a micro framework is. I've heard people say that a micro framework should be written in one file. I think that's kind of stupid uh, um, because you're just obviously not reusing what's out there. Um, but I, my definition, and I'm pretty sure this is what Richard Jones used the other year uh, when he did his micro framework shootout, was that it should be able to be written on one. You should be able to create a small app in one page. So that is a one page uh, um, pyramid app. Uh, which was actually my contribution to Pyramid. I said, it's stupid that all these other micro frameworks, they have a, a Hello World run on smack bang in the beginning of their um, front page. So I stuck one on the front page of Pyramid. Um, so in terms of how this works, uh, you can see the whiskey stuff getting made there. You don't have to do it that way. You can put it in, in, in GUnicorn or uh, whatever. Um, you've got this sort of configuration 
area. You can use decorators. I didn't use decorators here, but you can use decorators to, um, to do it. So you've got this slight um, added bit here where you're defining the root and then you're using the root. So this bit can go up into the, the decorator of Hello World. Other than that, it's, it's not that much different than uh, a lot of other sort of, you know, small frameworks you've seen. Um, but it has a lot of other stuff in there. It has this de declarative authorization system um, and permission system based around groups. It's, it's quite flexible. Um, it, has, um, it has this extensibility, this ability to um, aggregate um, different Python applications together. Um, uh, pyramid application, sorry. Um, it has uh, pretty good uh, internationalization support. Um, and it has, still has, it has the idea of, uh, so the interfaces and, and registrations under the hood. Not something you need to new, use right off the bat. You don't really see it at all. Um, but it's there when you grow bigger and you want to use it. Um, and you can use traversal. So here's, here's it using traversal. Uh, works kind of similar. Um, but there's a couple of differences. So one, you've got this resource. So this is your object. So imagine this next bit, this get root. Imagine that's not just like making up a whole bunch of things inside things. Imagine that's like a, an object that calls things out of the database and, or is a mem in memory structure. Uh, and what you've got right down the bottom here is this definition which says the context equals resource. So if during this traversal where it gets the root and then you, this will respond to a URL that says, uh, you know, A slash B slash C. Um, then it's going to render it using the Hello World view, which is there. So, and it takes, you can get access to that context. So that context, again, could be taken out of a NoSQL database, it could be taken out of an ORM, it could come from anywhere. Um, this form of, of, of you know, managing URLs, uh, it's not for every kind of application. It's really good for CMS applications where you're really kind of concentrating on the objects and the content uh, and all your things have a kind of a hierarchical structure. Nice thing about Pyramid is you can mix and match. You can have both of them working together for different parts of the app. Um, so this is kind of, I don't have that much advice when it comes to sort of micro versus uh, you know, Django. I mean, I'm talking to a room full of Django people, so I'm not going to convince any of you to switch from Django to another lightweight framework I, I'm imagining. Um, so if you know a framework already, you should probably use that. That's a good idea. Um, I think if you, a really important question of which framework you should use should be around, you know, access to developers, uh, access to easy answers, what's been done already, plugins, etc. And that's clearly in the Python space is Django. Uh, and that's, that's a fantastic thing. The admin stuff, do you want, you know, that kind of extra rail sort of stuff? That's, that's definitely a Django. Um, or are you trying to use the admin to really uh, emulate or, or create a, a CMS? Uh, you know, maybe you should be thinking about a CMS at that point, maybe Django CMS. Um, do you want your own DB? Well, I think it used to be the case uh, that you, you kind of uh, were working against Django a little bit if you, if you threw out the ORM and you threw out that and you wanted to use NoSQL. Uh, my understanding is it's not really the case anymore, so there's, there's less of this kind of, you know, if you want NoSQL, go with a micro framework. If you don't, um, if, you, if you do want SQL, then um, go with Django. Um, my opinion, if you want to go micro, I think, I think Pyramid's a really good one to check out. Um, and I shamelessly borrowed this from the Drupal community. I love this phrase, you know, the elevator that goes all the way up. You're not going to get stuck halfway. Um, so one of the interesting things that comes up, you know, I've talked all about CMS versus framework, and what happens if you've got something that's a bit of both, and it happens more than you think, you know? You've got something that's largely a content site, and you go and have an application. What are you going to do? Um, so I'm going to show a couple of... Uh, Sites, there's mainly sites we've done. So, so you can use iframes. That's one way to do it. This is how this happened because of various historical reasons. This um, emergency services bit is actually, it's not even a real application. It's mainly JavaScript, but it had, the, it had to be served uh, locally because of the way it was synchronized and so on. Um, you can use iframes. Iframes obviously have their own problems about um, you know, sizing. You've got to have an exact size. It, it's not so flexible. 
Um, but so what we're really talking about here is uh, we're talking about uh, where you've got mostly content and you want to put it, something appy in there. Um, here's something we did where um, one thing that a lot of people don't do, they, what they try and do a lot is they try and, uh, with CMSs, and they want something kind of application-ish in there, is they'll try and reuse lots of stuff that kind of almost does what they want, and then just end up in a big kind of mess because, it, you know, they're, they're um, spending too much time customizing and trying to get it to do things it doesn't do. Um, I think a lot of time, if you just go back to the base framework, most CMSs have some kind of base framework underneath. If it's a PHP CMS, then you've got PHP. A lot of PHP CMSs are built on top of uh, MVC frameworks on top of PHP. You can use that. Uh, Plone is built on, um, on Zope. Zope has its own framework. Um, so this is an example where we upload all the database, uh, all the um, timetabling information. Uh, and um, stick it in there and you can pick the roots and it shows all, the, all that. Um, another one we recently did all of New South Wales has to, you have to register your pool. Anyone got a pool in New South Wales? You should be using this before the 29th of October, otherwise you will get fined. Um, in this case, what we really want to do was we wanted to, uh, a lot of the content, we still wanted to have people be able to update it themselves. So we chose to use something called Plomino, which is kind of like a lightweight framework on top of the CMS itself. Um, so it's, it's another way to do things. Um, we didn't do the site, but what these guys are doing is actually they're proxying. Uh, so when it, most of the, uh, all the content on, on 131.500 is, uh, is, is using Plone, and then when it comes to this plan, trip planner, it proxies the requests and they go through uh, to this you know, custom um, trip planning system, which is run on these other servers, uh, and the results come back. Um, in general, not a really good idea to do this, by the way. Um, it has, means your, your CMS or your application is mostly sitting around for something else, uh, and there's all sorts of scalability issues with that sometimes. Um, there's a few other methods. Um, you could just use separate domains and separate URLs. This happens all the time. You'll have you know, the blog, the company blog, which is blog dot, you know, whatever in WordPress, and then you'll have uh, you know, the rest of the site app or something uh, written in whatever your favorite framework is. Edge site includes a really interesting one. We've been doing some stuff recently using uh, this kind of hybrid edge site includes proxy technique where we, uh, it's like doing a proxy but it happens in the middleware. Um, so all the security happens at the plone level. We check that first and then the proxying bit, then we release the, the plone threads and let it go back into the, uh, our reverse proxy stack and make the request from there. Um, it actually works pretty well, it's pretty cool. Um, so in summary, um, CMS is good for content. Um, CMS is good for non-technical editors where you need to give it to someone else who doesn't have to have, uh, you know, be a Django core contributor to edit the content. Um, frameworks are good for unique apps. Um, a CMS is good for content and unique apps sometimes, um, if you know what you're doing. Uh, but pretty much you can do anything you want if you know what you're doing. Uh, the more complex the framework, the harder it is to know what you're doing. Uh, but trust me, I'm a professional. I know, do know what I'm doing. Um, but we're also hiring, so if you know what you're doing, then um, have a chat to me. Um, thank you. Thanks, Dylan. Any questions from the floor? There's always a question. Um, okay, so you you made this sort of the odd. There's, there's, there's this sort of crossover point between framework and CMS payoff, and you know, the, the the natural competitor for Plone is really something like Drupal, and you sort of you're, you're competing feature for feature, not the fact that Plone is written in Python and, and uh, P, uh, Drupal's written in PHP. So that the underlying language is from that from that level of competition almost entirely irrelevant. The, however, from the other end, when you're looking at the frameworks, the language is really important because you're spending most of your time working in the language. Yep. The crossover point comes when, okay, so we, we do want to add an additional feature, write an additional plugin, extend the extra bit for, to Plone, and we need to know we're writing in Python. Yep. How, I don't know if you, you, and you alluded to this sort of point at the end, that there are ways you can sort of hybridize and, and, and get around the problem that way, but can you, can you elaborate at all on how hard writing the plugins are inside Plone, and 
so how far can you stretch Plone before it sort of it's, it becomes it becomes the point where you really should be using a framework, or you really do need to be digging very very low level? Um, I think I, the real answer that could, you can stretch an awful long way. You can. Um, like all kind of communities, and, and this is kind of alluded to when you guys are talking about like blessed plugins and stuff like that. The biggest problem with Plone is it's been around since 1999, so there are multiple ways of doing things. So there are really easy, great ways of doing things like browser views and things like that, but there's also an older way of doing things, and that makes it harder than it should be. So sometimes it's actually not that hard. Uh, if we could clear away that craft and, and all the old documentation and say, look, you know, this is the one way of doing things. And there's been a lot of efforts in that regard. Um, but you know, you've got uh, the Dexterity framework, uh, which is a content. Forget it. Um, it's a content um, types framework. It's um, being rejigged from the old framework. Really easy, just to create whole new objects and everything. <laughs> die, die, die. <laughs> so. Um, uh, I'm over here. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so uh, browser views, I think, um, you know, they're a little more complicated, say, than Django views, but they're not that much more complicated. So you've got a couple of different building pieces which are actually reasonably straightforward for building applications. Um, I think, yeah, the biggest danger is some of the old stuff and also the, the, uh, the temptation to reuse stuff that's already there and that screws people up, I guess, more than, than the reality of how easy it is. Um, one of the arguments I've seen for Pyramid is that since um, so much of what you would use is more of a library than built into the framework, such as the DB layer, a lot of people use SQL Alchemy, that you could reuse those components across, say, a CMS and a framework and for a site where you need those different components. Do you see that happening in practice much? Or uh, Yep, yep. I mean, there's um, there's been some pretty large... Um uh, installations where they've done just that. Um, they've, uh, for various reasons, they've um, used Plone, say. Because um, one of the things is that um, there's integrations with ZODB and stuff like that. Um, so uh, people have used Plone to do all the editing and everything, and they've got this kind of separate um, admin interface, and then they've used Connected Pyramid up to the ZODB, and they've got this blindingly fast, you know, have all the cruft of all the extra bits and pieces of framework to do with editing. Uh, in your request layer, so you can have uh, uh, an anonymous view layer um, accessing the same data out of the ZODB. Um, so there's been a few um, um, installations like that. Um, you could do exactly the same thing with uh, SQL Alchemy, um, where you can just yeah, hook it up to existing database and then have that same database used by um, some other application, say you know another CMS, for instance, pulling content out of that. So. I'll ask the last question. We've heard a lot today um, about, uh, well, questions about the future of the web and how Django, what Django's place in it is. Do you have a characterization of uh, how Plone is dealing with those questions? Is it comfortable? Is it worried? Is um, I think, yeah, I mean, I think the, you know, the hardest thing for a, a CMS to grapple with is those different roles. So you have to, you have to build something that's not only uh, easy for the core developers um, to, to edit and, and work with, but you have to use something that's easy for end users. Now, the problem you have with an open source community is the people with the most influence are those core developers. So you'll often end up with things becoming more technical than they should and not understanding the, prob the, the issues that an integrator has. Like, if they're coming into Plone, uh, how, do they, uh, how do they edit, um, you know, how do they take a theme and, you know, traditionally some of the things they've had to do is, like, Plone is very setup tools based. You've got to learn about packages and stuff like that, something that Django avoids, but uh, it's, it's something that you have to learn about in order to start writing Python code in, in Plone. Um, so I think this is, this is the hardest thing. In my personal opinion is that Plone should be going much more through the web. The coding should, and happening, you could see that I showed you the, the Diazo's kind of theme editor where you could do a lot of customizations directly in the interface. I think that sort of thing should happen more. Uh, it allows a, a kind of a, a SaaS type um, service to exist and work really well because you can have really customized sites using you know, purpose-built 
uh, UIs and you don't have to uh, know about Git or code pushing or anything like that. Uh, and that will um, be the, the, the bit that gets people in, you know. Uh, there's all sorts of things about, um, you know, uh, other CMSs like, like WordPress, like hosting is much cheaper with WordPress than it is with anything that involves an application server like Plone or Django, right? That's a barrier to entry for new people. Now, some of those new people are never going to be core contributors. They're never going to grow the community, but some of them are, right? You know, and, and we as developers are, are just as lazy as everyone else. We like something that's simple to understand uh, and simple to get started and be productive with. And that, that little bit of, uh, you know, ease of, ease of use at the beginning um, grows the community. And I think Django has, has done that really, really well. And that's something I think that Plone should um, really look at about ways in which to make it more accessible and get more done uh, with less at the beginning. Great. Thanks very much, Dylan. Thank you.